Good afternoon. Welcome to session two of European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford Engineering. My name is Burton Lee. Today is Monday, January 11, and we're very pleased to be featuring two uh, very interesting world-class hardware startups out of Europe, uh, this time out of Central and Southeastern Europe, specifically out of Croatia and Slovakia. Our first speaker is Igor Zacek, who is CEO and co-founder of EcoCapsule, a very interesting uh, affordable eco-home uh, technology, platform technology, which they're bringing to initially high-end markets, kind of a, a very similar to Tesla model. And our second speaker is what I consider Europe's leading electric car startup today out of Zagreb, Croatia, led by Mate Rimac out of, out of Croatia. We're now going to shift from Slovakia down to Croatia on the Adriatic coast uh, from habitats, to electric cars. And I've been to their facility, their factory in Zagreb. I was very impressed, which is why I invited Mate here this week. So Mate Rimac, <coughs> Rimac CEO, founder of Rimac Automobili out of Zagreb, Croatia. Thank you for coming all this way to Silicon Valley. Tell us what you're doing at Rimac. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, Burton. Uh, and especially, I'm very glad that people from companies like Tesla, and uh, I have been told that also from Google and some other companies have, are attending this uh, session, so that's a great honor for me. So thank you very much. Uh, so um, we at Remac Automobili, we produce uh, what we think is the next generation of supercars. And over time, we have evolved to do many other things. So we are, at our core, more a technology company than a car company. And we provide solutions and technology components to many different uh, applications and industries. I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, just at the beginning, uh, we are from Croatia, a wonderful, beautiful country. Um, everybody thinks that their country is the most beautiful one. I'm pretty certain that I'm right. Uh, it's an amazing country. Uh, really, so many sites and so many uh, beautiful uh, cities and uh, landscapes. So uh, the company is based in a small town right next to the capital of Zagreb, uh, also a beautiful town of one million people. And uh, our facility is just a two hour drive from Smiljani, which is the place uh, where Nikola Tesla was born, uh, the guy without whom all of this wouldn't be possible. And I'm extremely pleased that the company that uh, Martin Eberhardt has founded here in Silicon Valley uh, carries his name. Um, so by the way, this is his house where he was born. So Croatia is a small country of 4.3 million people. Uh, we, uh, we are located in Central um, Europe. Uh, we have a GDP of $60 billion. Just to put things into perspective, Google has uh, $66 billion revenue last year. Uh, BMW had $90 billion. Uh, Volkswagen had four, point, four times the revenues of Croatia. And Silicon Valley, with its 3 million people, had nine times the GDP of Croatia. We don't have a single venture capital fund, and the ecosystem of startups is just um, starting to exist. So a little bit about my background. Um, I loved cars since ever since I can remember. So one of the embarrassing photos is coming up. So I didn't even go to the toilet without my cars. So uh, I went to Mechatronics High School in Croatia. Uh, and at the end of that uh, school, you have to make something physical. My colleagues did something like a stroboscope or things like that. And I had this idea uh, that uh, televisions and other devices will be connected to the internet. So remember, that was back in 2006. And that people don't want to have these bulky input devices like uh, mouse and keyboard uh, on their couch. So I just had this as an idea. And being an average student, I didn't think uh, to do anything more with that. But my professor liked the idea, and he sent me over to a local competition for electronics, uh, which I surprisingly won. Then they sent me to the national competition, which I won as well, which was an even bigger surprise, as I wasn't a good student. So they sent me all over the world. And uh, big surprise, I came back uh, most of the time uh, home with uh, gold and silver medals. So um, at that time, I had no idea what a startup was, but I learned that I can build something uh, with my own hands, which is quite uh, competitive. So uh, as soon as I turned 18, I bought an old BMW, which was two years older than myself. Um, I bought it to race, but the gas engine didn't hold up very well and blew up soon after that. So uh, inspired by Nikola Tesla and his invention, the induction motor, 
I decided to build an electric race car. So um, I built, I converted a car in my garage first with purchased components, and I started to race. So I raced against gas-powered cars because I had no other electric cars to race against. Um, under the same rules and regulations, and of course, at the beginning, everybody was laughing at me. Uh, I heard all the jokes, what are you doing here with this washing machine? Are you crazy? A thunder will hit us. <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, but eventually, you know, I started to improve the car after each race. You know, when something broke, I, I improved it. The components that I purchased, I replaced with stuff I did, for, I did by myself. And I started winning. So in 2010, I won the first race with that car. And soon after that, I broke five FIA and Guinness World Records with that old BMW, which I still hold. Um, then I decided, you know, there's not much of this BMW left. I want to make a car from scratch. Uh, why this picture? Because the car industry is dominated by huge companies. The car industry is the biggest consumer market in the world, uh, in the US at least, I'm not sure if, uh, for the world. Uh, so uh, the companies are a century old or older, thousands and thousands of employees, uh, as you have seen, bigger than, than my country. Uh, in terms of revenue. So I was one guy in a garage. Uh, and back then when I started in 2009, the image of electric cars was, was not what it is today. It wasn't sexy, it was more something like this. Um, and Croatia, uh, I guess you, you haven't heard of many products from Croatia, that's because we have quite a weak economy. I have forgot to mention that, uh, that we have only half of the imports covered by exports. And uh, most of the economy went down uh, after uh, Yugoslavia fell apart, of which Croatia was a part of. Uh, so Yugoslavia cars, you might know this. So combining the image of electric cars with uh, Croatia as a country which didn't have this kind of industry was not really a good starting point, but I was very stubborn and I wanted to do this in Croatia. So um, I coincidentally found the first investors uh, pretty soon after I started from Abu Dhabi. A friend of mine was working for the royal family of Abu Dhabi, so I, um, I got a term sheet and a contract very soon. I hired the first people and um, we moved into, from my garage into a facility to design and build the world's first electric hypercar, uh, which is a category like beyond 1,000 horsepower, so the concept one. Uh, when we presented the car, uh, when we built the first prototype, we were just eight people. And the idea was never just to make an electric version of a sports car. My idea was actually to improve the sports car, to make it better, because I believe the electric motor is a much better machine, that Nikola Tesla's invention had so much more potential. Um, Tesla is showing that, of course, as well, with their cars, which are really uh, taking, um, completely changing the, the industry landscape at the moment. Uh, and we wanted to do that for uh, electric sports cars. So uh, with our architecture of independent motors, we, we are working on a system which is called torque factoring. So we have four motors, one powering each wheel independently, which allows us to precisely control each wheel, in our case, 100 times per second. Uh, we have incredible performance, 1,088 horsepower, uh, 325 kilometers per hour top speed, which is about 200 miles per hour, uh, 1,600 newton meters from zero RPM, um, 2.8 seconds to, to 100, so really crazy performance. Uh, just one example where we apply this technology. Um, so we have built a race car for Pikes Peak, uh, for the, one of the most challenging hill climb races in the world, or the most challenging one. So this car had the same powertrain like the Concept 1, uh, 2.2 seconds, or actually 2.3 seconds to 100 kilometers per hour, 62 miles per hour, and 5.4 seconds to 200. Um, and what I want to show you is how this torque vectoring system works, so what it does. What we see here on the left-hand side, uh, the r blue bulk is um, throttle pedal position, and then torque on each wheel. And on the left-hand side is also the power in and out from the battery. So when it's negative, it's recharging the battery. When it's positive, it's discharging the battery. So the energy flows to the powertrain. So uh, in this application, the powertrain, the torque factoring system is really distributing the power to make the car fast. And this is a really dangerous track. So here we are at very high altitude. And um, here we can see an example of what happens when the car loses control. So this is not our car, this is somebody else. And don't worry, those guys walked away from this accident. So our guys that did this control software have the um, responsibility for the life of the driver and of our customers. So what happened in our race was that the driver lost his mechanical brakes in this situation. 
And you will see now in the slow motion video how the system has reacted, shifted the power between left and right, between each wheel separately to catch the car much faster than the driver would ever be able to do. I'm pretty sure that our software engineers saved the life of the driver in this situation. Uh, by the way, he had his 65th birthday on that day. Um, and he, he finished the race without brakes because electric motors have regenerative braking and he came second overall. And that was the first time in history of this race, of the 100 year race, actually that was the 99th year, that electric cars have uh, triumphed over, over all the gas powered cars. So two electric cars were faster than all of the gas powered cars. So that's, uh, yeah. So that was, uh, a good example of, of uh, how electric cars can actually really be better. So when I started to, to work on uh, the car, uh, I never have imagined that we will have to do our own infotainment and powertrain and stuff like that. Um, I knew how the car industry works, that a number of suppliers supplies everybody in the car industry. So you have the same headlights, um, I mean the same supplier for headlights or the infotainment unit for your BMW or Mercedes or Volkswagen or whatever. So I went to those companies, and I, I remember in one occasion uh, when I asked a company that makes the steering column controls um, if they can make something special for us, uh, the guy asked me uh, how many units uh, I need, and when I told him, he first called his colleagues and he said, can you repeat? I repeated, and then they were laughing together. <laughs> so they either um, tell you we don't want to work with you because you are too small, or don't respond at all, or they send you to their special divisions which deal with small companies, with small projects, which is companies like Ferrari or, um, or bus companies, uh, tractors. And um, if they want to work with you, they still want, uh, you know, they still have a huge price tag for each little piece. So I remember at one meeting in, in Germany I had, I had sent a list of about 10 things that would be interesting for us, mostly small bits and pieces. And this company uh, came to me with a rough estimate of 20 million euros just to get access to their existing parts, which are already a generation old. Um, so that was the moment when I realized, okay, I don't have that kind of money and we can't do that. Um, so we have to try to do it our, on our own. There is no other way. Uh, in the meantime, the investor, which was supposed to give us money, pulled his funding because he wanted us to move to Abu Dhabi, the whole company. And uh, being the stubborn guy that I am, uh, I wanted to prove that it's possible to do this in Croatia. I refused this offer, so we had to survive with uh, minimum amounts of cash, which was really difficult. Uh, so we, we started to work for other companies. Uh, that was the only way for us to survive. We have actually stopped our own vehicle development program and started to, to do this kind of things for other companies. And that was the only way for us to survive. And the only, way why we'll, the only reason why we were able to do this is because we have done those kind of things by ourselves. If we have just purchased things off the shelf from other suppliers, we wouldn't have anything to sell to other people and we would have gone bankrupt a long time ago. So we produce really everything in-house. As far as I'm aware, we are the, the highest vertically integrated company uh, in the automotive industry. We, we machine our parts, we make all the carbon fiber uh, pieces, even painting and all those kind of things. Um, so just a few examples of the beautiful parts that we make. We, we don't just make them functional, but also beautiful. So here's our ECU, our battery management system, even the headlights. I don't know of any other car company that makes their own headlights. All the carbon fiber bits and pieces, uh, powertrain components, uh, even the mechanical parts, uh, all the buttons um, or infotainment system and all the mechanical parts that nobody will ever see, we are trying to make them also beautiful. And of course, we make our own software. Uh, so pretty much the whole car except some standard parts like the brakes. So uh, our technology is being applied to, to many different applications and industries. Um, I can talk about a few of them, but unfortunately the car industry is very secretive, so some customers are fine with us uh, sharing what we are doing for them, but with uh, other customers we can never mention. So uh, we apply our technology already today to uh, other supercars, to the naval industry, to racing, uh, even to wheelchairs. Um, and we have done projects for a number of um, global big companies and also small companies, ranging from full vehicle development. So customers come to us and say, guys, can you develop me a car like this? Or can you tell me which kind of car you would develop for this project? And then we do the whole thing from the first idea to the finished car. Or for some other cases, we supply smaller parts like the infotainment system or powertrain. 
This is a collaboration where I'm very proud of. This is Christian from Königsegg. He was my role model, my big hero, because he's one of the few people that have built a car company in the last five decades. He's very successful with, with, with that. He's the global leader in, in um, I mean, he's one of the leaders in uh, hypercars. So this is the Koenigsegg Regera, the, the world's most powerful car. And we are supplying the battery system and some electronics for that car. Um, and I'm really proud of that because I was always looking up to him and he's a great inspiration for me and a big mentor. So um, yeah, the dreams are coming true uh, in my case. Yeah, and after we have uh, really, um, had the track record and the company was profitable. So since 2012, we are a profitable company. Then finally, we received uh, funding. So we have now three international investors on board. We had our first uh, fundraising round uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, before of that, to, in order to survive, I had a bank loan um, and revenues from, from uh, the customer projects that we were doing. But until 2014, we basically didn't have real investors. So it was extremely difficult for me to find investors. In Croatia, for example, there's not a single venture capital fund. So this also enabled us to really grow uh, quickly. So we have scaled up to 150 people and we are hiring uh, further. So we will probably double in this year as well. So I have a great team of people. I'm really proud of them. Uh, and Croatia, had not having a car industry, uh, nobody has done this before. So we really had to do, we, we had to build up the company First the know-how, then the company, you know, the, the team, um, because nobody has done that. And we had to do all of the mistakes and, you know, learn from our own mistakes. So we work hard, but we also play hard. Uh, we, we have a lot of fun. And um, we were also voted as the best employer in Croatia last year um, by our own employees. So this is an anonymous uh, survey. <laughs> yeah. Anonymous survey, which is going on uh, amongst companies in Croatia, uh, amongst the employees, and I'm really proud of this because the, the people uh, from our company have voted us as the best employer. So, and we are really also doing some interesting stuff when it comes to, to hiring new people. We have a very creative HR department. We always do riddles and, and uh, do things differently when it comes to expanding the team. And we are trying to be a great place to work. So we have uh, our facilities, which are um, quite nice place to work. Uh, Burton has visited them and we, I'm trying to improve that uh, all the time. I'm also very uh, concerned about f uh, the environment and food. So I'm trying to make my own farm and restaurant where we grow our own organic food and consume it uh, at our facilities. And what, what I'm also quite proud of is that we are um, inspiring young generations. So the children are coming from all over Croatia, Europe, and the world. We just had a big uh, delegation of uh, Israeli students coming to us um, to, to see the factory. So uh, what we are doing now is we have our supercars in production and new cars in the pipeline. Uh, that's just a part of our operations. That's more to show what we can do as a company. We are using our technology to spin off new products and, and, uh, and companies. So we have a spin-off company called Great Bikes, where we produce high performance and high end electric bicycles really with innovative features and new models coming also uh, delivered already to 20 uh, countries and five continents. Um, and the interesting thing is that we apply the technology from supercar, let's say from toy for rich guys, what I originally intended to do as a car enthusiast to something completely different. We, we have changed the life of this guy who is unfortunately tied to a, to a wheelchair. We have given him with our technology 10 times more range. And we are now, um, you know, that changed his whole life, uh, how he can get around. And we are now trying to commercialize that uh, technology without uh, any profits to, to enable this uh, for a much larger group of people. Uh, the company is also now scaling up. So from s single and low volume uh, products, we want to go into medium size production, not with our cars. So we will still be a sports car manufacturer with very limited production volume, but very high end, uh, showcasing and developing technologies with our supercars. But the actual business is in supplying our technologies to other companies. So we are currently also going through certification and global homologation, which means our new models will be uh, crash tested uh, all over the world, which is a big expense. Uh, very. Uh, uh, hard for me also to see the cars going into walls, but that's the necessary evil in this industry. <laughs> so we are also in our second fundraising round, and we are um, planning to open up um, development and sales offices uh, all around the world, including uh, Silicon Valley. 
so I hope that we will have a stronger presence here. Now we'll just um, talk a little bit um, very shortly about uh, where the industry is heading. So we have hybridization and electrification, which is basically you know the same model where people buy cars to own them and use them 5% of the time and not using them 95% of the time. While I think the much bigger change is coming with new uh, mobility concepts, which means buzzwords are, of course, autonomous cars, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, car sharing. All those factors combined will completely change the landscape of the automotive industry. Um, and I think it's really necessary. Uh, it, so as I said, the car industry is the biggest uh, consumer market in, in the USA. And there are about 1 billion cars on the planet. The US has about 750 cars per 1,000 people. China has grown from 2000 to 2010 20 times, and they still have only 60 cars per 1,000 people. So if they want to, if China will use the same business model for, for transportation like Europe or US, they will have to, we as, as a society will have to invest so much energy and resources like copper, aluminum, plastic, and so on to produce that many cars that will sit around for 95% of the time that I think that the, this has to change and this will change and there are many smart people working on that. Uh, we are also very much involved with, with those kind of projects, with autonomous cars in particular. We have built our first autonomous car for a German company a couple of years ago and that's also one of the directions where our company is heading. Um, so we are doing our small part of contributing to that change, not just for automotive industry but also for um, for uh, naval industry, but also some other, like aviation. Um, yeah, and I hope that uh, we can help accelerate the world to go electric um, in different industries. So um, do our small little part and make uh, Nikola Tesla proud. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mate. Um, what, how does the, the cost of an engineer in Zagreb compare to the cost of an engineer in Germany or London, for example, or UK, for example? Yeah, uh, that has, that's also a challenge for us. Uh, the Croatian salaries are, of course, much lower. And I think the difference between the salaries is much, much lower. So I, as a CEO, I make about the same as the uh, engineers. Uh, whereas I think in the U.S. The, the difference is just huge. So when when we want to hire somebody from outside, you know, that person wants like three, five, or ten times more than I make, uh, which is difficult to justify uh, towards our other employees. Uh, so that's why we are mainly still a Croatian company, and I try to to use the local talent. Uh, so a Croatian, let's say you you want to hire a Croatian engineer fresh from from the university. Um, and you ask him how much money do you want to make, he will tell you, an optimistic guy will tell you $1,000 a month. Yeah, so I'm not sure how, how that compares to here. Questions? Eilif. And I'm sure you know that um, quite a bit of the money flowing into uh, electric startup companies, particularly in California, coming from China, yeah. including Faraday Future, and they're developing that platform concept that uh, Burton referred to earlier. So are you thinking about China, are the Chinese uh, manufacturers, investors coming to you and standing in line at your door? Yeah, actually uh, our biggest customers and investors both are Chinese. So we are just developing a full car for a Chinese company, including production of prototypes and helping them set up the production then in China. So uh, what I forgot to say is this, you know, uh, new technologies really open up the door for other companies and, and I think Tesla has done a great job there because people, a lot of people have made money with Tesla and so many other people are trying to do that. At the time when Fisker failed, it was impossible to raise any money for, for an uh, electric car startup. Right now it's still hard because people want to invest in the next Instagram and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm not a fan of those kind of startups. Uh, so I won't tell more. Uh, I'll stop here. <laughs> so for us as a, you know, making these kind of complex products which need to go through certification and people's life depend on that and so on. It, it's difficult. People don't want to invest in things like that. Um, we have, re have received funding from China uh, and uh, China I think is a really great market for us for the B2B side and US is, is a great market for us for, the, uh, for our supercars. So we are, you know, having Croatia as the home market um, so there is basically no whole market. We don't have any customers in Croatia. So we were forced to think globally from day one. So 
we, we basically operate with, with the whole world. But for us, it has proven that uh, the Chinese investors are most keen to invest in things like that. Questions? Yeah. Yes. There are so many companies approaching us with um, that idea to make a car to compete against Tesla, <laughs> you know, making <laughs> a four-door sedan. Uh, I think people don't realize how difficult it is, how well of a job Tesla has done, um, and I don't plan to do that. So we will keep, uh, we think that we are best at making sports cars. Uh, we are very good at that, and that's our niche. Uh, we, I don't think it will be possible for me to scale a company to producing uh, tens of thousands of cars in Croatia, especially the, the uh, funding that would be required for that. So we are fine with staying, uh, in terms of production of cars, a low volume manufacturer, but on the other side, we will scale up our components uh, business and supply people that will do that. So we are happy to support those kind of people, uh, companies that want to, to uh, do those kind of cars. But always with a disclaimer, I always tell them first, guys, are you sure that you can do that? Uh, I will be happy to take your money. But uh, it's, it's a big challenge to, um, to, do, to be better in what what Tesla has done. So I'm, I think that I'm a technical guy who knows a little bit about this stuff and the car is really great and the price for what it offers is really great. So making something better in that space is really difficult. Yes. What's the breakdown of your sales for your components versus the actual supercars? Uh, one third, two thirds for, uh, in favor of the business to business. Are the uh, left and right hand side motors on the car connected mechanically in the center? No, so they just share the housing, have a common cooling system. So we have an oil cooling for rotor and stator and a dry sump. So it's just the same housing, um, but the motors are completely independent. <coughs> so we have a vit virtual differential. I'm sorry. What percentage of your workforce is engineering versus administrative or management? So we have uh, 60 engineers, uh, 60 people in R&D. So I don't necessarily hire people with an engineering degree to do engineering work. Um, and we have a large production. I mean, uh, <coughs> most of the remaining people are in production, uh, machining, uh, carbon fiber, trimming, and those kind of things. And what percentage are, are from Croatia and, and from outside Croatia? It's pretty much everybody is from Croatia. We have maybe five people outside of Croatia. OK, that's impressive. Yes, yes. You talk about a lot of uh, challenges uh, of being in Zagreb in terms of talent and I think in terms of investors. But then you said you, you were stubborn and wanted to stay there. Why, why stay there? Why not go somewhere else? Is it just patriotism or was there some hidden competitive advantage of, that, of Zagreb? Uh, that's a tough question. I, I get that often. Um, and I'm not sure, really. You know. Uh, I, I, it is a patriot thing. I want to do this in Croatia. Uh, on the other hand, I don't want to do something that's bad for my company. And I'm not sure if I'm doing that. Uh, we are doing quite well. It's, we, I'm happy with the way the company is growing. Um, so if you would have been in Germany or in the US, um, would we do better or worse? It's hard to say. Uh, so um, I'm pretty happy with how it is. Uh, but. It can always be better, so that's why we are op opening also, we will open uh, other offices around the world. Uh, but I still want to remain in Croatia because I think it's possible, um, and I want to show it's possible. Uh, if it's the easiest way, I'm sure it isn't. Uh, but uh, yeah, somebody has to do it. <laughs> Let's see, yes. Well, first, congratulations. I think this is a really inspiring and beautiful looking car. Uh, I'm a car guy as well. Um, you have mentioned anything, and I would like to know your take on um, the difficulty of um, the infrastructure, essentially, the need for deploying EV charging. Tesla has done a great job deploying appropriate the supercharger network. What's your take on that? Uh, I first think, um, I think that's a good question, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the first thing that we need to change is the mindset. We have to educate the people. So uh, people think you need 500 miles range. 
uh, what you really need is about 30, 40 miles range uh, for 90% of the cases. Uh, people ha that have electric cars, it's no rocket science to them. They all know, know this. But uh, electric cars currently account for one per less than 1% of the global market. So we need to educate the rest that you, you don't need this kind of huge uh, range. So for the rare occasions where you go further, uh, you need a fast charging or battery swap network. And Tesla has proven that uh, this is already uh, possible today. And uh, we, as a company, we, uh, we don't want to make our own network. We are too small for that. So we are using the global standard, um, CCS standard, uh, for uh, fast charging, which is about the same uh, charging speed as the Tesla infrastructure. But there's another thing that comes up that people think um, will be a challenge, um, that the infrastructure will not be able to support uh, electric cars, which I disagree with because electric cars will actually help the grid with two-way communication. Okay, that's not working today yet, but it will very soon. Uh, because the grid is um, facing challenges with peaks and you, know, you can't shut down a plant overnight and stuff like that. So uh, electric cars will actually be helpful to, to take um, excess energy when, um, when necessary and give it back to the grid uh, when it needs it. Um, and at the same time, uh, contribute. So I, I actually think that uh, even when a large portion of the, of the uh, society will be using electric cars, it won't be a challenge. But on the other hand, also what I want to mention when we talk about infrastructure, autonomous vehicles will be able to use uh, infra so roads, infrastructure much better. Uh, so you, just by switching the way we use our uh, transportation, we will be able to, to, um, to use what we have already much better. So this will also uh, be a very good thing and save a lot of, of uh, money and uh, efforts.